it is my absolute pleasure to bring up to the stage Dr. Lynn Lopresto, who has um, her Master of Science in Clinical Nutrition from the University of the Pacific. She's a public health nutritionist and advocate for child nutrition programs. And I can't wait to hear what she says next because I learned so much yesterday. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lopresto up to the stage. <laughs> well, to the people I met yesterday, welcome back, and hello to the people that I didn't meet yesterday. Um, I started off uh, just sort of framing the wellness policy issue, and today I'm going to talk about one of the research projects that I was involved in. Um, the title of this is the quality or School Wellness Policy Quality Among Low-Income California Districts After the 2016 USDA Final Rule. And this was a study that was done while I was finishing my doctorate at UC Davis. And get on to the next slide. Um, this was done by a team of people. Um, I sort of was the coordinator of the whole thing as a graduate student, and I worked with Dr. Diana Cassidy and Dr. Melanie Dove, both at UC Davis. They're both school tobacco policy researchers, uh, and they were asked to take this on. Um, a lot of things that we do in public health, uh, when we look at policy, we learn a lot from the work that's been done for many, many years in the tobacco area. And since nutrition policy is a relatively new thing, uh, we use some of their expertise and, and guided me through this process. Uh, so again, this was a, a, a project that was funded through the California Department of Public Health. And they wanted to just get an idea of how are we doing in California with our wellness policies. So for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'll try to give you a quick background. Um, I started out as a hospital dietitian and was really frustrated watching people die of things that were completely preventable. So I decided to go work in public health and I was hired by the Marin County Department of Health and Human Services and they put me on schools. So I was introduced to uh, school wellness policy basically as it first started back in the early 2000s and uh, was trained by uh, Crystal's predecessors, um, and we worked sort of on that process, helping all of the districts develop their wellness policies, also being a, a registered dietitian nutritionist and health educator. I was on the ground in the schools, uh, and then in San Rafael, where I was living, Dominican University of California is there, and I was hired to teach the future health professionals and future educators, so I taught their nutrition and health education classes, and I would bring them with me out into the community. So after doing that for 15 years or so, um, sent my son off to college, and I said, you know, one of the things that's been really frustrating is watching funding come and go. And we do so much great work. We did so much work with school gardens, and then things kind of fell apart as funding fell apart. So for me being here at this conference and hearing these connections to LCAP and other ways that, that, that we can create sustainable funding is great. Um, what I decided to do was go get that doctorate in public health and figure out how I can help with some of that evaluation. And so this project was the first thing that they put me on at UC Davis. So I'm gonna sort of talk you through that. Um, we all know why we have wellness policies. Um, and one of the reasons why we look at the quality of wellness policies is because that's actually where the power is in a policy. If you have a comprehensive policy, it lays out all the different areas that it's gonna be covered and it shows commitment and the strength of the language that you use adds that extra power to it. So we will do this versus we aspire to do this. So one of the ways that we uh, 
evaluate those policies is, is commonly using the WellSAT, which is the same tool that the Department of Education is um, asking you guys to do. Uh, so we know that those stronger policies do indicate commitment, and they also help with implementing on the ground. So we collected a sample of 200 local wellness policies from websites of low-income California public districts. This was done in 2018, so it was after the final rule, and all district policies were expected to be updated by that time. Little did we know that COVID would hit and life in schools would be really, really different. So it provided us an opportunity to have, as I hear my students say, the before times, <laughs> information from the before times, maybe as a baseline to start with, uh, and then we kind of go from there. So this was a randomly selected sample. There are some 1,028 districts or something like that. I'm looking at Crystal. Um, so we pared it down just to the, the low income districts and the definition that we used here for low income was they had to have at least one school in the district that had at least 50% of the kids eligible for the free and reduced meal program. Uh, and then it was randomly selected because we wanted to make a representative sample. Yes, I read all 200 policies. <laughs> That's what I did during COVID. Um, so we, it's not possible to read everyone's policies, but by making it a randomly selected sample, we really wanted it to be representative. So there was a certain number from Northern California and Southern California, and then representative of each of the, the counties. And I'll, I'll show you the data, and we even made sure that there was a equal number of small and medium and large districts and so on. So again, we used the WellSAT 3.0 to evaluate the policies. And then we also looked at district demographic factors. And the idea behind it too was we wanted to see if there were certain types of districts maybe that were struggling harder getting their wellness policies done. So as I was reading, and I did have two other people that helped on part of it, I was the only one who'd been on the ground and I'm reading the policies and reading the policies and I'm saying, a whole bunch of them look exactly the same but I still had to read every single one. So we decided to throw in looking at what the key templates that were out there, the model policies, and then to try to track, did they actually use this? And those that used the policies pretty much used them verbatim. So I did read, we had to read all of them and see if they did something unique and score them. But then I also documented uh, if they had really used a, a model policy template to do that. And then we also wanted to keep track of the adoption date uh, to see hopefully that all of them had been updated by that time. So the data here uh, are mean average numbers, basically, mean or average numbers. So the district enrollment average was 10,500 students. And we had tiny districts that you know, had well less than you know, maybe 500 students. Um, I do know that Los Angeles and San Diego were in there only because they stand out with the huge number. So Los Angeles is also counted in there with uh, 600,000 students. So this is the average across. So there was a, a lot of small districts as well. As I said, similar proportion of small, medium, and large. Um, about 7% were high school only. So the majority of them were K to 12 or K to 8. Um, nearly two thirds were of the students in this whole population were eligible for the free and reduced meals. 75% uh, had a non-white majority and approximately 70% were from urban areas. So we tried to have a mix of different districts. Half of the policies were adopted after the 2016 USDA final rule which meant half of them had still not been updated by 2018. And again, we took these from the, the district's websites because part of the, the wellness policy requirement with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act is it needs to be uh, made available to the public, part of that transparency. So we pulled everything that was available. Districts may have had a more updated policy, but it wasn't available. 
So the overall average score was for comprehensiveness. This is again the extent of the language in the policy of the, the areas that were recommended um, was 65 out of 100. So that would mean about 65% of the recommended language was there. And the mean policy strength score was 37.3 out of 100. So when you present, I'm, I'm used to presenting to academics and so you add all kinds of like statistics that are really cryptic that no one would know what they mean. So instead I wrote what the ranges were. So what that tells you is the very lowest score in comprehensiveness was eight and the very highest score was 94. And on strength, the very lowest score was a zero and the very highest score was 84. So these are the averages that are there. When we look at national averages, uh, those averages are not, California is actually doing better. So the average score over the United States was 54 out of 100 and the strength score was 33 out of 100. Okay, so that doesn't mean necessarily fail, right? It just means this is where we are and there is room to grow. And again, this is, this is our starting places. So this is our only really California only data that's in aggregate. This was the part that was um, concerning for me, but having been part of the collaborative, which I was able to join after and really learning about these efforts um, to, efforts are already in place to address this. So about 80% of the districts basically adopted a model local school wellness policy, mostly verbatim. So 68.5% actually adopted the CSBA model policy. 13% adopted a national template. And so this was either the Alliance for Healthier Generation or the NANA, which is the National Alliance for Nutrition and Activity, I think. And that, that policy um, hasn't, I don't know that it's been updated since. So about 12, it turned out to be, I think about 12% adopted the Alliance for Healthier Generation, which is a very comprehensive policy. And it's great being able to go after all the different presenters because at that time they didn't have the policy builder. So that meant if you adopted their policy, it's, it's a very comprehensive policy. And it was hard for a lot of districts to, um, to actually commit to that at that time. But I think that districts didn't necessarily feel they could take that template and just leave some of the things out. They kind of saw it as a all or none versus that's a model policy that you could take it and change it. And I think the policy builder really does that. So this is what we have so far. And obviously when you're doing statistics, this is why I was concerned because if 68.5% basically used the same exact policy, that's really gonna sway your data. So then when we did our analysis, we found, so that the two national policies were combined so we could have a big enough sample size, but the Alliance for Healthier Generation, when you saw those 96 numbers, uh, those were some of those policies because they're, they're very comprehensive. It was just a small number of districts that actually used it. So when we looked at the overall findings, we didn't find a difference in districts that had adopted the CSBA model policy and those that had developed an original policy, which was the intention of the original legislation that was passed, that each district would develop their own policy that was useful and relevant to their district. So that's the part that I found interesting because the, the rule was about make it work for you. Yet most of the districts simply copied and pasted a template. Having been someone who was on the ground, I understood why, because districts are really, really busy. So yesterday I presented a lot of data talking about just getting this conversation going has made such a difference in the school, food environment, school food and activity environments that it served its purpose that way. So I don't find this data distressing now that I'm part of the collaborative, it's a starting place. I see some of your faces going like this. And I just think that it's good to have as a starting place and, and where we can grow from there. So then also adopting the national model template, so that Alliance for Healthier Generation uh, template 
actually had significantly higher scores than both the CSBA or those that developed an original policy. When we looked at those that 50% that hadn't updated, uh, that made a difference really in the strengths of the policies. So that commitment to the language, we will do this. And I think the biggest part of the, um, the final rule was, was enforcing that you had to make that triennial assessment. That, that's really what the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act and the final rule did is um, upping that, that strength the, the commitment to things a lot more. So you, that's really the difference that we see is that the strength scores um, increased uh, related to whether they had updated their policy or not. So on these numbers are on average again. So the mean comprehensiveness score with that national policy on average was 17 points higher than um, having an original local school wellness policy and 15 points higher on average than adopting the CSBA model policy. And then the strength score depended on whether they were update compliant. And obviously those that were, um, had been updated were 27 points stronger um, and only 11 points stronger if they had not been updated. The one other district factor that we saw associated was districts that had more than a thousand students actually had stronger policies. On average, it was about five points higher. So, I mean, it makes a difference if you're looking point by point, um, but compared to what they used as their model standard really made the biggest difference. When we look at this with the smaller districts, it just kind of makes sense that small districts have a harder time leveraging the, the support and funds to actually have a coordinator. Uh, and some of the larger districts had were able to do that a little bit easier and get that support. So the conclusion from this is that basically at the district level engagement in the local school wellness policy development process was low uh, just because of that high use of, of templates. Um, one of the things that makes a difference is if you're using a template, make sure that you're using the latest version. That's something else that we learned from this. And I think something like the policy builder, you're guaranteed that you're using the latest version. So it's, it's wonderful that that exists now. And that smaller districts may need some extra support um, just because it's harder for them to leverage that money or, or a staff person really to be in charge of that. So obviously like most research studies, our conclusion is more research is needed about districts with strong nutrition wellness programs and local school wellness policies. And to me, that's what this whole conference has been about, is bringing the people who are the early adopters and hearing what they did and, and how they got there and sort of paving the way for everybody else. So um, commonly recommended strategies then are using the WISC model uh, and then uh, also tying it to the local control funding formulas, which I'm so grateful to be after you guys just hearing about that. Okay, so I want to briefly talk about ideas to increase engagement at the district level and obviously um, Oops, I'm going to go a little faster for just a second skip over obviously the WISC model uh, and then tying it to that local funding control formulas is just a way to get that wellness coordinator uh, so that you have someone who's really overseeing this process uh, and then also doing it in this integrated way um, I think can be really helpful to bring people together. What I also love, this is some of the stuff that I talked about yesterday and I'm so happy to see in the policy builder um, that you can also look by these topics areas and then see how wellness policy fits in as well. I spent a little more time yesterday talking about some of the research that supported these different areas. So obviously we know the links with, with both food and activity and learning. Um, absenteeism, and that was brought up earlier, uh, those school breakfasts can make such a difference. And then hearing about the 100 Mile Club, you know, getting kids to show up, how these things can be so important. Um, and to have that then as part of your wellness policy, it just makes it so much easier to tie into then the, the LCAP um, as well, because you're, you're adding to that important piece of the school environment. Obviously, there's physical health uh, and um, 
both diet and physical activity play into that. And then two of the things that I brought into yesterday that I want to end with um, is talking more about how climate is affecting things and um, what Dr. Margaret Sater talked about is I presented some information about studies uh, talking about mental health issues and particularly one of the things adding to students is climate anxiety and studies that have been done saying um, so many of the kids are, are really preoccupied with this, they're thinking about it every day. And that when we can make those connections for students with the things that we're doing on the ground, that positive collective action helps reduce their anxiety and it also inspires hope. So one of the things as we do encounter more climate emergencies, whether they're heat emergencies, uh, whether they're uh, because of fires and evacuations and so on, what are the ways that we can set up our school day, uh, that we can incorporate that, water breaks, things like that. Some of it starts with just making sure we have access to that water, um, needing to maybe reschedule our physical activity around that. And then the sustainability piece, we've heard a lot about farm to school, composting, waste management. These are all things that can be addressed in your wellness policy and that we make that explicit when we're talking to the kids. It's not, we've tended to approach things before like, well, this is better for your health or this is for sustainability, but it's a both and. And I think that that's how using these models can help us start seeing things as a both and. And one of the words of the words of wisdom that I brought up yesterday as well was from Larry Cohen from the Public Health Institute. And he said, a good solution solves multiple problems. And so that's a way to also build in what you're doing is where we want to do this, but do you realize it's also helping you and it's helping you and it's helping you. So bringing those pieces together, this is a wonderful model to do that. So I wanted to use two examples to bring it back to wellness policy and so the strength and comprehensiveness of policies, how we might go about that. And I wanted to start with water. So when you look at the requirement this is from the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. It says, schools shall provide access to free potable water in the food service area during meal times in accordance with education code, blah, 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 blah. And that they will encourage students to increase consumption of water by educating them about the health benefits of water and by serving in an appealing, an appealing manner. So while I was a student, I also got to work with the Nutrition Policy Institute and Christina Hecht. And they had done a, a water project with high schools and they it was a photo essay contest and they asked the kids to take pictures of the drinking fountains. And this was an example of one of the drinking fountains. Okay. So if this is the law, that is in all of the model policies. So all the districts met that because it's in the model policy. And if you have a drinking fountain, but it looks like that, you're actually meeting the requirement for your wellness policy. Would you drink out of that drinking fountain? Probably not, right? Um, what we also know from the great work done with the Nutrition Policy Institute and Anisha Patel down at Stanford, a couple sips from a drinking fountain does not adequately hydrate someone. What I have learned from my students, I'm now um, I'm teaching at Dominican for years and I'm now faculty at University of the Pacific in a master's in clinical nutrition program. So I always give my students an assignment that they have to make a behavior change. And most of them take on drinking eight cups of water a day because they hadn't really done that. So they have to set goals for their self and all of that. And then I also have them keep a diary. So how do you feel after doing this? And over and over and over they say, I used to have a headache every single day. I used to feel tired in the afternoon. Those are just examples of how being dehydrated affects learning, right? So just staying, like hydration is a simple thing we can all do and now you throw in, we have much higher temperatures and how we're managing that. And if your only drinking fountain is in the cafeteria and if, if any others on campus look like this, how are we doing, right? So the USDA does a school meal cost study and the latest one they did in 2019 
They do a similar thing where they randomly sample districts to give us an idea of what's going on around the country. So what they found, they actually go out on the ground and they see what's happening. They found 49% of districts offered drinking fountains within the cafeteria, 36% were within 20 feet of the cafeteria, a quarter offered water dispensers or coolers within the cafeteria, only well, 2% offered bottled water at no charge and 3% offered bottle refilling stations. So I find those numbers pretty low. And I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to move through this fairly, path, fairly quickly. So if you're seeing free drinking water available, you're, you're meeting this policy, but is that really going to work, right? So think about, you've got the nutrition education, you've got your organizational policy practices, right? How can we work with wellness policy and do all of these things? There's funding available to schools, for infrastructure, uh, for the facility stuff, right? This is ideally what you want to have. So you want to have refill stations, you want it to be clean, uh, you want to have adequate water flow, um, you want to have education materials, and you want to even have cups available. And I provided resources from last time with links to all of these from my talk yesterday. Okay. And can you also make your language a little stronger? We will do this. We will do this at all of our districts. We will have water available throughout the school day. These are ways that you can build with that. And I'm sure the Alliance for Healthier Generation, um, this is directly from the WellSat. Okay. The Alliance for Healthier Generation tool has some of these things. Um, that language came from the Alliance for Healthier Generation, their original policy. And then what are the other areas that you can do that? So even in the farm to school area, uh, basically just having a, a statement that, um, I have it here so I can read it up closer. Addressing local foods for school meal programs. So can you give percentages? Upland has a great example. There's a lot of early adopters here. Uh, so what, what stuff are you going to put in your wellness policy? Can you even give a number to the percentage of local food that you're going to, um, to increase? Or uh, can you address anything about waste and waste management? Can any of that start going in your wellness policy? So that's where I want to end. And what I want to just say is um, working in this field for a long time with, with different people, people are afraid to put it in their wellness policies because, well, you know, what if we can't do that in the future? And I think that a lot of what we've heard today is a lot of this stuff, it's a thing now, as the young people say. It wasn't really a thing before, but, but it's, farm to school is a thing now. And there's a lot of support for it. So if there's a time to start building out your wellness policy, it's now and it's needed more than ever. So. incredible and yes we will let's tell her we're gonna do it we will um, you're I love it I love it your work and research in this field has been incredible and uh, we just really appreciate it it really helps as people who are implementing this policy and really those boots on the ground to see what's working what's not uh, resounding it's it's customized make it about us reflect what we're doing well um, I just think that was so great. And this idea of incorporating into the LCAP, I got to be really honest with you guys, I entered this uh, this week knowing it was going to be great, knowing there would be a lot of networking, but feeling a little down about my own wellness council and what's going on. And from yesterday and today, I have such tangible takeaways to bring back and make this work more collective, more of a partnership. These ideas of connecting through um, our local or LCFS funding and making this much more of a statement throughout the entire district and not just through food and nutrition services um, is very inspiring. So thank you for sharing your research with that.